Well, welcome. How about your second conference? <laughs> and where are my oldies but goodies? <laughs> Third conference buddies. <laughs> Well, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the trip to be here. I know it's not easy. We've done it. So thank you for being here. But guess what? This conference was amazing to launch us forward. Our team at Columbia was able to collect natural history study data from 50 of our families over this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> They were able to collect our, our partners at Simon Searchlight blood samples from 70 of our family members just yesterday. And you heard Dr. Mirza speak yesterday about how hard it is to collect EEGs. We collected 30 of them. So thank you, thank you for being here. This effort starts with us and ends with us. So thank you. All right. I'll go over why this is important, what do we do with that, all that data in a little bit, but let's dive right in. Oh, I need to do that part. <laughs> Maybe. All right, so a little bit of background, and some of you have heard this a million times, and I'm sorry for that, but we do have a lot of first comers as you saw, and uh, we wanna make sure everyone leaves here with, with that foundational information. So Jordan's Garden Angels was founded by Cynthia and Joe Lang. They're the parents of Jordan. She was diagnosed with PPP2R5D at the, in 2015. And really the mission of the foundation is to do research for rare diseases. This is the first one. I'm confident we're gonna solve one and move to another one. We're gonna help more families reach there. But for now, this is our focus. It's PPP2R5D, 2R1A, and 2R5C, and now known as Jordan syndrome. And our first, uh, our repeat offenders here that were at the first conference know where that term came about, because uh, when the Lang family uh, joined our Facebook group and joined our community, months later, we were all in D.C. for that first conference, and the families were just so touched by what they brought to the community and the research team and the funding that everyone voted that we want to name the syndrome after that little girl. So that's where Jordan syndrome came from. So this is a board of director for Jordan's Garden Angels. You can go to the website and read more about each uh, of these um, individuals that are really volunteers, they don't get any compensation for doing this, and their role is to really make sure that as a organization, we're uh, adhering by all the laws and regulations that a nonprofit has to adhere to, but, we're, but really the main thing here is to make sure that we're focused on our mission, which is the research, and everything we're doing is helping move us forward towards that. You met our uh, superstars yesterday, our research team. I really hope you got a chance to go up and uh, see all the work they've been doing. Uh, but I wanna give you a little bit of uh, insider view on how this relationship is working. So Jordan's Garden Angels was able, with the help of our uh, researchers, negotiate with each one of these institutions and put together a master agreement across all of them. And the goal here is that says, we're gonna do this as a team. This is a collaboration. Traditionally, how research works, everyone does their own work. Years later, they publish, that publication comes out. Other researchers in other labs and institutions learn about it, they use that data, and they work forward. But we don't wanna do that. I heard you all say, when is this gonna be ready, right? I mean, we all wanna get there. So to condense all that time, we have that agreement in place. This team meets regularly. We have these workshops. They share the data, secret data that no one else knows in the world. They use each other's information. They brainstorm, they challenge each other. Each of them went and built a team. We have a lot of students dedicated on Jordan syndrome, and that's because of the funding provided by the foundation. We almost have two to three researchers, scientists, and clinicians 
working on this project for every individual we have with Jordan syndrome. Just think about that. And take the time to go in and look at, you know, all the information again is on the uh, website. We always have to balance how much do we share here and how much do we count on you to do a little bit of that uh, homework and come back with questions. But it's all there. You can read that link is about what each lab is doing. The update in your um, pamphlet also talks a little more about that. All right, so I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes sharing about the high-level roadmap. Again, some of you have heard this before, but I think it's important for all of us to keep in perspective all the path that the team is working on. So phase one of the research was to build what uh, we've been calling it the toolbox. So this is initial important tools that we need to move us forward with the research. And that includes the clinical publication. So we published on 2R1A uh, last year. Uh, our 2R5D publication is in review and we're crossing our fingers. That's a, a quicker uh, process. And 2R5C is in process. So what that means is uh, that our team is using this data that you're providing in Simons through Simon Searchlight to really define what it's like to, to be an individual with Jordan syndrome. Many of you, when you got your diagnosis, they give you a piece of paper with telling you there's six people in the world with this, and then you found 250. So that's how outdated that information is out there, and that's why it's very important for us to provide that data, to tell the medical community, we are here, here's what it looks like, it's not what the publication currently shows that it is, so we're, it's really important for us to do that. The next is the iPSCs. So I mentioned we collected blood samples from uh, 70 of our family members. We've done blood samples at our last conference. We've done blood samples at our first conference. So that's been something that we've uh, done every time. And the way we use these blood samples is uh, part of what we do with them is creating these iPSCs, induced pluripotent stem cells. Doesn't matter. What, what this means is we're taking the blood and through technology, we're converting them into neurons or brain cells. And that's giving the research team an insight to our children's brain. How does it work? What does it do? And then when we're testing, we start with the cells. Are we seeing changes on that? And uh, they're already doing a lot of that. They don't share it because they don't want you to hear a drug and go and get it and give it to your child. So, they're, but they're doing that and they're seeing impact on uh, the cell level. And what that means is like, okay, well, let's look at it in the mice. Do we see that impact in the mice? And okay, what does that mean for our children? So that's kind of how uh, that path goes. Which brings me to the mice models. So we have mice models for multiple of our um, variants. And uh, you'll see in a little bit that it's, we have a lot of variants within the group. And really when I say variant is like, okay, within the, P, let's take an example, PPP2R5D gene, there's different positions that this mutation can happen at. Think about like a word and you have a typo. That typo can happen in any of the letters. So it's kind of the same way. So within the variants, uh, we have mice models for multiple of those. Uh, we're starting with the more common ones because we can learn a little more from the families on that and then implement it in the mice. But some of these studies that we're starting in the cell, we're also looking at the mice. And the good news for our community and what I understand from uh, Dr. Strack and the team, that that's not always the case. The good news for our community is that these mice models really mimic what our children behavior and, and symptoms look like. They have the larger head size. They have the same kind of developmental delays. They experience seizures. They have the frontal bossing, so even physical characteristics. So that's really good news for us because, again, we don't know, but that gives us a hint that maybe that means that when we test things on these mice models, 
is it gonna really tell us a little more about what it means when we're human? Is it gonna translate one to one? Time will tell. And I remember getting that first text from uh, Stefan, I don't know if he's still here today, maybe they left early this morning, with our very first little puppy, PPP, to our 5D mouse. And I cried, of course, but now we have close to 100 of these mice that are being studied, that are looking at. Uh, we have some at UC Davis, we have some at Dr. Jansen's lab at K KU Leuven, and then we, we have some at uh, Iowa and uh, Dr. Strack's lab. So all these mice, they're getting looked at in a different way. And, um, and information and actual um, mice are being shipped across. So we have Dr. Uh, Hugh is uh, looking at the brain activity, the seizures activity. Are they overexcited? Are they underexcited? What does that tell us about that? So that's all happening there as well. And then we have nanobodies. If uh, you get a chance to talk to Brian, if he's still around this morning, he'll invite you to come to the alpaca farm and uh, meet the alpacas that are contributing to our uh, research. But they're really creating nanobodies and uh, antibodies that the team is using in their experiments as well. And also on a fun side note, we actually get the wool from these alpacas and we do projects and we've used them for some uh, fundraisers. And just that direct link from these animals that are helping our children are also helping us financially through our fundraising. And the last thing here, you heard uh, Youngna talk about 3D models. And that's really looking at things with a big microscope. What do we know about that structure? Why is it that one, 98K and 200K are next to each other, but yet they, one is milder than, uh, than the other. What does that tell us? How do we understand? And then the rest of the team suck on that information and they use it and are like, oh, let's look at this, let's look at that. So the team meet regularly. We have virtual labs uh, once a quarter. Uh, we have in-person labs twice a year, in-person meetings twice a year. Uh, COVID kind of put a hinder on that, but it was really nice to see everyone again after a couple years of not being able to meet in person. And that's, that's when the magic happens. That's when everyone takes the time to do a data dump. This is what we've done since we've met the last two months. This is what we've learned. And I know we're making progress because they identify the key question every time. What is our next key question that we need to solve? And that key question changes. So we're not to the end yet, but we're definitely getting there. It's not at a step that I can necessarily understand. Most of us won't really understand or appreciate what that means because we're all focused on that goal, but they are too, and these steps are getting us there. So that's the toolbox. Now our toolbox is full. We have all this information we need. What do we do with that? We're, however, also looking at other ways uh, to still grow this toolbox, actually. Just uh, Dr. Jensen's was pitching in, Why, what if we do worm models? She's like, we have so many variants. We don't want to not study anyone. We can't have 500 little mice. It's, they're very expensive. But we can study worms and make every colony of worms a different variant. And it's quickly see what does it do, what are we looking for, and do that at a larger scale so we make sure we're including even our one-off or two-off variants within the group. So we're using this in three ways, and you heard some of that uh, yesterday as well. One, which as a team, we believe maybe it's the fastest way forward, is the hope to find an already FDA-approved drug, a drug that has been through all the safety measures, that is used for a different purpose that we can take and repurpose for our children. So that's one approach. Maybe we need a few of those, kind of looking at different uh, symptoms and different areas, right? So, and that's what they're doing. You'll hear them talk about high throughput screening, and that means taking these panels of FDA-approved drugs and just running them through the screen and looking at the parameters, at the outputs, what does it do? So that's, that's when we, uh, we're doing that. Uh, hopefully we won't have to uh, recreate a drug from the ground up. You know, the hope is that uh, these genes are on well-known pathways for other conditions that 
just tweaking one will get us there. Again, time will tell. And then the other way you heard them talk about gene editing. I know it sounds very sci-fi-ish, but if you stop by our UC Davis folks, I don't know, yeah, Jasmine is still there. Jasmine is looking at ways to go in and edit the genes, remove the misspelling, and fix that typo. Sounds simple, right? But how do we do that? How do we effectively do that? How does it impact? And we're really lucky as a community because this technology exists today. If we were having this conversation maybe five years ago, that wouldn't be an option on the table. And the reason we're doing these multiple paths is we want to look at maybe short-term, middle-term, long-term, right? What gets us there faster? But also, do we want to put all our eggs in one basket? We don't. We want to explore, we want to keep it open, and we want to look at how to move forward with, with all these interventions. And the third thing is kind of an intermediate way, right? We talked about the pill. You take them every day, maybe one, maybe five, and, you know, they they affect our children anyway. And then uh, we talked about gene editing. You go in, one and done kind of solution. But there's something in between, and that's the ASO uh, technology. And what it does, it's an uh, injection to the spine, so it's not very easy to, you know, a pill is a little easier to deal with. But it's gene editing, but uh, not permanent. It's just for three months at a time. So you do it. if. If there's side effects, something didn't work, we didn't like it, it washes away. You don't have to reapply it. So we were um, looking to partner with a nonprofit to do that technology for us. And in all honesty, we got a little deprioritized because they have cases with life-threatening uh, conditions that they prioritize over us. But the team is like, fear not, we'll make our own. So that's what our team at UC Davis is looking at right now. How do we create our own? But we're looking at other, other avenues for us uh, to go and do that. Sorry, I'm spending a lot of time on this slide. I, I realize that. All right. So, and I talked earlier about the master agreement. And what I didn't mention then, I'll mention now, is what this also does for us as a group and a community the foundation, George and Garden Angels, owns a licensing right to whatever comes out of that, right? So if there's a new patent or anything, it gets divided amongst everyone equally. Again, teamwork. Uh, and then the, we own the licensing right. So what that means is we're, we're at that point where we're ready to have these conversation with pharmaceuticals or have these pills ready. We don't want it to be a $1,000 pill. We don't want it to be a million-dollar injection. And that gives us a negotiation power. We'll say we'll have the community. We have the solution. You have to work with us. If you want that information, it has to be accessible for our families at a reasonable price. So that's why we felt very strongly about that. And all the institutions have told us they've never done this before. They've never done the work and given someone else the licensing rights. But when we made it about their, the children, when we explained this is why we're doing this, to protect our families, and if you read about some other diseases, MSA is an example, they have a cure. These children can, can just do in one thing and, and be done and not deal with, uh, with that disease ever again, except it's a million dollars. Not everyone can do that. So we're keeping that in mind, and, and um, that's been on Joe's mind from day one. How do we protect our children so we have that forward vision so when we're ready, we can do that? All right. Next slide. Okay. So switching gears a little bit, you might have questions on the research. We're going to have time for questions uh, after this, and uh, we're hoping Joe will, will be able to join us to answer those, uh, help me answer some of those as well. But I want to encourage you to do take the time and go on our website. There's really a lot of good information out there. There's a blog you can read about some of this. There's a resource center. This is where the new update, it's also in your binder. It's on Whova. It's that 17-page update about details, about what's happening, about the research, about everything we've done so far. Uh, their um, children's book, there's really a lot of resources. I want to encourage you to take a minute and, and do that. And then uh, last year, we launched a podcast. Many of you uh, have uh, seen and heard from Christina on that. But that plays two roles. One is we want to give ourselves another way to tell our story. We want to give our families a way to uh, 
uh, communicate, but we really as a foundation want to play a bigger role in the rare disease space. You heard yesterday about newborn screening, about access to genetic counseling, about the STAT Act, and like we think this is all, oh, we're doing this, we find, we find the, the pill, we'll take it, we're good, but there's so much involved in this. What about the future generation? Are they gonna know they have Jordan syndrome and be able to take that medicine? That's where newborn screening comes in. What about access to genetic counseling? And we're from Colorado. There's no, no access to genetic counseling. Until last week, we were the only family there, and we were diagnosed in New York. So where are all the families that have these diseases? They're not accessing the testing. They're not accessing the information. So that's another way we're trying to contribute to the big picture through that podcast. There's a lot more on the website. Please take a minute and look through. All right, you know your team. I heard a lot of love towards this team. Uh, we're all ready for a break from each other, but, <laughs> but we've worked tirelessly to put this event together. Christina, Brittany, Larry, Kayla, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> And these are our emails and our personal cell phones. Just text us, call us, anything you need. We're here for you, truly. I mean, the team feels so strongly about what we're doing. And just that passion is enough. And these conferences, I know, fuels everyone to want to go and work even harder. All right. Now let's talk about goals. I mean, I spent time on the research because that's the core of uh, our mission, but these are the pillars. Every year uh, we sit down, you know, November, December, January, and we think as a foundation, as an organization, what are the key things we want to accomplish this year to move us forward, to elevate that bar, to elevate what we're doing a step forward. And these are the 2022 goals. There's a list of 100 items supporting these. If you'd like to look at that, I'm happy to provide it. Um, but this is research we talk about. Access is dual access between families and research and, and vice versa. This conference is a perfect example of access, so that's one way we do that. Educate. We heard yesterday say, well, what about all the adults that are out there that have Jordan syndrome and they don't know? Well, what, why am I the only person in my state with Jordan syndrome? How rare it is? Not that rare. People just don't know about it. And this is why we need as a community to spread the word, educate our medical professionals. We have resources for you to use to do that. All you have to do is say, hey, take a minute to read this. Hey, local hospital, did you hear about Jordan syndrome? And our families have been doing a good job at that, but we really need to keep doing that over and over and over. Think of autism. Everyone knows autism today. You know why? It's because it started with a group of families exactly like this, and they build it from the ground up. I'm sorry, it's us, but it is us. We have to do it. We need to be that next autism. So when people hear Jordan syndrome, when they see a child, they can recognize this, is, this could be Jordan syndrome. Let me put you on the right track. The next thing is reach, and that's really our uh, outreach effort. We partner with a lot of uh, groups and other organizations. Uh, we have social media presence. Uh, Brittany and Christina both work really hard to ensure that is happening, and this is really important to get us out there. And, and we're known in the community. Uh, Rare Reality Podcast was named as a, a one of the best rare podcasts uh, in the rare disease space. Uh, we are invited to speak at uh, conferences. We are connected with other groups that are trying to uh, do what we're doing, and we might have met one of the dads that was here yesterday, and that they're starting that from the ground up, and we tell them, listen, we can help you with this. You don't have to learn, for, learn from our mistakes. You don't have to repeat it. Fundraise, I think that's self-explanatory, but we wouldn't be able to do a lot of what we're doing today without fundraising. And we have a few superstars families that have really uh, stepped up and helped with that, but every little bit helps. It's small details that will make a difference. It's 
it's the 250 of us together that will make a difference. So we can continue to do events like this. We can continue funding the research and moving what we're doing forward. And then one new uh, pillar we added this year is the advocacy. And I talked a little bit about that, about how there's really, this is bigger than what's happening in this room today. There's a lot that the rare disease community is fighting for and we wanted to jump on that train. And we have a parent volunteer that might be uh, starting a, uh, a a task force to help do that. What does that look like in the US? What does that look like in the UK? What does that look like somewhere else? And how do we make that advocacy effort going forward? So let's uh, talk about our community a little bit. Uh, Nancy, who many of you know, has started that Facebook group seven years ago, I believe. And it was her and Emma that is in here today. And uh, Jane, right? And a few of us started popping up, and Nancy and I would sit there waiting for a request to join the group, and we were like, oh, we're almost 10, we're almost 50. Now we don't text each other anymore when we have a new family. She's like, where is the count? <laughs> but it's really exciting to see that coming from the ground up. We're in all these countries, and uh, we'll talk about the ambassador program in a little bit, but it's, it's really, heartwarming to, for, for me personally to say I have best friends all over the world and I, I truly, truly mean it. So let's talk a little bit about the data. You heard from Dr. Chung yesterday. She shared about uh, 80 families. That's the data that um, was fetched from Simon Searchlight through the efforts in the last few months. We're actually at 120 families registered in Simon Searchlight. Thank you. And that's a huge increase. We're, however, not f at full capacity yet, so we need to keep moving forward. So I wanted to show what it looks like from our community. This is, none of this was uh, checked by someone that knows what they're doing, really. This is just family saying, I have this variant, I have this variant, us keeping track of this now massive a spreadsheet and providing just that high level data to the uh, community. So you can see for 2R5D specifically, we have 233 um, identified. They probably grew by a couple this uh, weekend. I'll have to go back and catch up. But uh, we have 70 of our families that have, they either don't know their variant or they didn't share the variant. Uh, if you're not sure, that's on the first page of your genetic report, and uh, we're happy to help you decipher that. But you can see that there are kind of some pockets. E198K is 30% of our population, followed by 200K, which is around 11%. And then if you group the 2 t 2 D251 uh, subgroup together, there's the A, the V, the H, the Y, there's um, you know, would be the, the third population. But you can see there's a lot of other in there as well. So we're really across a lot of uh, different variants. For 2R5C, I remember uh, we had one family for the longest time. They're not here today, but then we had two family, and then we had three families, and now we're connected uh, with nine. And I know Verily and her effort will bring in more families towards us, So, because she's identified 20-some uh, families with 2R5C, and that's I think that publication will also help uh, attract them uh, to our community. And then uh, for 2R1A, we have 44. Uh, 21 have not reported, and then we have a lot of uh, one and twos in there as well, but R182W is the most common. And within 2R1A, and I'm sure you got some time to uh, meet with Billy and digest what that paper she, uh, her team launch talks about, but there seems to be two subgroup. One subgroup is uh, more uh, closely to what to, to our 5D looks like, similar with 2R5C, we believe 2R5C looks a lot like 2R5D. So really the intent here when we do uh, clinical trials or anything else or is to step back and look at all these family of genes as like one disorder and how can we look at them that way? So one, maybe learning one will help the other, but two, no community is left behind. So that's really the goal 
And I know our team feels very passionate about looking at that as a group and, and moving the whole family of this order forward. All right, so I wanted to highlight a few uh, initiatives that are happening within uh, the foundation here. Uh, one is the Special Projects Committee. We uh, often got you know, families saying, what can we do? How can we help? And we're like, okay, well, let's do a special projects committee. And we had over 20 uh, family members say they wanted to participate in that. And we formed five subcommittees. We've been uh, meeting at different cadence, but it's really looking at different projects and identifying different ways to, to help the community. So uh, a lot of the things we worked on, the research subgroup, look at how do we increase research participation? Remember, I told you we went from 80 to 120, so that was 50% increase through some of these efforts that as a group we focused on and moved forward. We also looked at, okay, well, we have these new families coming. How do we support them better? We did a survey. We looked at pain points, what's working, what's not working, and we created a family roadmap. You're coming, you're seeing us, when you're first coming, just worry about this one or two thing. When you're ready, go a little further. When you're ready, you can do more. Because we realize there's so much happening that it might be overwhelming for families, and everyone is ready at a different cadence, so we wanted them to give them that opportunity to just walk through that path as they're ready. We also looked at how do we address our global community a little more. Who's here traveling from outside the U.S.? Look at that, look at that, that's amazing. And, and we realize that Georgian's Garden Angels is founded in the US and we're very US driven and that's why we need your help. I'm not gonna know what challenges Italy is facing and that's why Luca stepped up and he formed their, their global community and they're gonna come back and tell us this is what we need and we're gonna do it. So we really need your help to be these strong pillars across our community all over the world. Come back, give us ideas, tell us what you need and we'll support you. Then supporting day-to-day -day care, we mentioned the care before, the cure guide. I really want you to take a look, especially if you're a new family. It's really a really nice summary about what to expect, what, uh, what specialists should you meet with, what therapies should you do. It gives you a little bit of a guideline. Uh, it was kind of a little bit driven by a request from one of our families that their teachers don't know what to do, their therapists don't know what to do. So we had that medical kit kind of talking about more science, medical stuff, and we needed something that for our teachers, for our families, for our therapists, and that's where, where that came from. And lastly here we have the fundraise subcommittee really looking at how do we do small events, how do we do big events, how do we support existing events. And our JG ambassadors, uh, we launched that uh, just uh, last month and we really want that support across and I think we've grown the group by a few through this uh, conference so you'll have a an updated list on languages and regions that are supported, but we really wanna ask your help. If you don't help us, we don't have a way to reach our German community. We don't have a way to do, no one else is gonna support these families the way that you would. So thank you for our ambassadors. Can you self-identify one more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have new members <laughs> for our Dutch community. Excellent, and, and that information will be available. And the thought is that a new family can just email connect at jga.org in any language of their choosing. One of our ambassadors will understand it and they'll uh, respond to them and they'll create that one-on-one -on -one connection with them and talk to them. I mean, I talked to Karina after she did her first onboarding and she's like, I don't know why I'm so happy, but I'm feeling really happy right now. And I'm like, I know the feeling. <laughs> so, so well done. Um, so this is our list of our ambassadors, um, but as I said, we've grown by a few, so c just keep an eye out and reach out to your communities, and uh, we're happy to um, do a 90-minute training just to get everyone on the same page and then send you off to do the great things that you're doing. 
All right, uh, I'm gonna ask Lexi to come up and join me for this slide. And I'll let you introduce yourself, Lexi. Thank you so much. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lexi Levine. And I am here today because my younger brother, Barry, who was born when I was two, was at that time diagnosed with an unspecified neurological condition. Um, some of his symptoms were that he wasn't able to talk or walk, and he had really bad seizures, as well as a few other medical issues. Um, but when he was well, he was the happiest boy, like you see in this picture here. He had actually just come back from a month inpatient stay at the hospital, and that was his face after that. So that kind of gives insight to how he was as just a human. Um, but unfortunately, Barry passed away in 2015 from Jordan syndrome. And um, it, I, we still did not have the diagnosis at that time. So I was fortunate enough to be working with Barry's former neurologist. And um, one day, I got a new patient who reminded me a lot of Barry. And we started talking about how Barry's case was such a mystery. So he gave me a few suggestions as to how I could reopen the case. And of course, I followed all of them. This was in May of 2019. And then August 2019, I got a call from his former genetic counselor. And all she said was, we found it. And I said, found what? <laughs> um, we had gone to the genetic counselor so many times and we're just told everything was normal and negative. Um, and so to hear that Barry was the 106th person to be diagnosed with Jordan syndrome, especially after he had passed away, was just so amazing. And I am now so excited to be able to give back to the community. Um, so I... <laughs> So I'm really excited to announce we have a brand new sibling support pro program in progress. Um, as some of you may know, we launched our first ever Sib Shops this weekend, which are workshops specifically designed for people who have a sibling with a disability or a life-threatening illness. And I don't know, I'd say they were a pretty good success. I saw some really good friendships made coming out of them, and we talked about a lot of really hard things. like. You know, um, what's going to happen in the future to my sibling once they age out of school? Am I going to take care of my siblings when my parents can't? Am I going to have a child like my sibling? Um, those kinds of questions where you can never get a good source of information except for the people who truly live it. So a lot of these uh, siblings self-identified that this was the first time they were meeting another person who had a sibling with a disability. So I know for me, it was always very, very therapeutic to be able to talk about what was going on with Barry without having to explain every little detail. And I saw that yesterday with the siblings. They really were able to, you know, kind of riff off each other. One would say something, and that would spark something in another. So I'm really excited to try to continue this throughout the year and potentially do some of these on Zoom. We also have a sibling resource guide that we did hand out to any of the siblings who attended yesterday's Sib Shops, and that will also be uh, available online for any parents who are wanting it. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. We have a new siblings email that you can feel free to reach out to me um, if you have any questions there. You, I'm also in the Facebook group. Please feel free to reach out. I would love seeing you know the families that I'm connected with. It feels like I know you guys already. Like I love watching your kids. and. Um, just to wrap it up, I just really want to sincerely thank everybody for allowing me to participate in this and um, keeping Barry's memory alive. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and is Nancy still here? Nancy Sherlock? Oh, here she is. Many of you might have uh, met Nancy. Uh, do you want to come up? And Introduce yourself. I'm sorry, you just took my No, just, <laughs> I, I know you got it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Nancy Cherlo. My brother, Frank, was uh, diagnosed after he passed away with Jordan syndrome. My brother um, was like your children. Uh, when he was young, he didn't walk till he was three years old. He was always um, a little bit learning disabled. Um, I, I don't know if you all read my story, but I'll tell it again. We, uh, my brother and I went to Catholic school and they just kept promoting my brother from one grade level to the next. And my mom, when they were promoting him from third to fourth grade said, look, it, my, my son can't 
add one and one, and you can't read three words, and so what are you doing? And they're like, well, we didn't want to embarrass you because that was like an embarrassment and then you, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So because you're such a nice woman and you volunteer your time, we're just promoting him, and they suggested that we put my brother in um, public school where they had more resources. So he um, went to public school in fourth grade, and um, at that point in time, somebody taught my brother how to read and how to do basic math, and uh, the basic math was a great life skill because he could always count his money. Uh, he could read the newspaper, and he could write us little post-it notes and put them all over the house. He loved to do that. Um, and then when he, oh, so um, he went to a technical high school where um, you try all different kinds of skills, um, cooking and landscaping and wood shop and metal shop, and you know you can kind of figure out like what you want to do with yourself. And when he graduated from high school, my mother was able to get him a job in the town there that we lived in, and he worked for the parks department. So he cut grass and shoveled snow and painted playground equipment, and he was really happy to do that. And he had some very nice friends who were compassionate. My brother was always a very mild person, very obedient child, so no matter what the work list was, he was happy to go there and do all those things. Um, and he was able to work till he was, for 25 years. So, but at age 38, he, he, he also got like the, the city truck, so he drove the truck to the different parks and did whatever he needed to do, you know. Um, he started to have car, little car accidents, like he would put the car in reverse and his reflexes were not as fast as they used to be. So he'd smash the car behind him, smash the car in front of him. So they gave him a partner and then he was still able to work for 10 more years. The last thing he was able to do at that job and, and his boss, you know, was in contact with me and said, look at this is really a big liability for us and, you know, maybe it's time for you to, con to try to talk him into the retire retirement. The last job he was able to do was uh, he had a s stick with a nail at the end and he would poke the garbage and pick that garbage up off the stick and put it in the garbage can. And, but he was still happy to go there and be with these friends that he had every day, you know. So anyway, then he retired. He retired at 38 years old. And so then life became very lonely. There was no one else, it's just me. My parents are old. So um, I always knew that I would take care of my brother. So it was time for us to build a house where he could be comfortable and live his life with me. So we did, we ripped down a small house and we put up a big handicapped accessible house. And oh, in the meantime, you know, my mother had a two family house where um, she, she stayed upstairs and she put my brother downstairs and he felt like, wow, I have an apartment, you know? <laughs> she did the laundry, the cooking, the cleaning, and she wrote the bills, but he had an apartment and he was so happy. So anyway, so the house, and okay, so the medications became more and more and more. He was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and my mother was had a heart failure and 11 times a day she'd have to come down the stairs and make sure he took his medication on time. And so now the house is finally built and my husband's like, oh my God, forget this. Just tell them all to come here. <laughs> so they all came. <laughs> so they all came and um, my father, they were only there three months. He fell, broke his femur. So we needed now to add a live-in to the dynamic of the household, you know. So um, my father only lived three years with us before he passed away. When he passed away, my mom was in the hospital. She had a heart attack, so she never made it to his funeral. Uh, so after that, um, of course, we had to keep the, the living. And so my mom lived five more years after my dad passed. And my brother lived two years after my mom passed. Um, things got hard, but he was with us most importantly, every day. So I could watch, you know, it's very, very difficult to find the, the right fit of a person that's gonna live with you and take care of your family because there's nobody that's gonna take care of your family the way you do. So there's things that you have to overlook and other things that you just cannot. 
So it keeps changing and changing and changing. And there were days that I was coming home from work and he was sitting outside in front of the garage and he's like, this one has to go. <laughs> I'm like, well, this one can't go because we gotta find another one before this one goes, you know. But for the most part, thank God it worked out. In America, nobody pays for um, live-ins for you. Nobody pays for medical equipment. Thank God my brother had a job and my brother saved all of his money. And so we were able to buy that van that we needed for $35,000 and the chairlift that we needed for $11,000. And we went to, uh, we went to a elder, an elder care lawyer who advised us on how to spend his money on him and make sure we had a t paper trail because we never knew if uh, at any point in time we wouldn't be able to take care of him. We needed to put him in a nursing home. They would look for all that money and make sure that you have every documentation for that, and we did, and thank God, because that was my big, biggest fear because he was my, every, my everything, and I was able to keep him forever. My mother uh, was one of nine, big family. And uh, when things were rough, I would talk to my cousins who were like my sisters, and they would say, you know, it's time for you to think about putting him somewhere. And I can't do it because cognitively he understands everything and there's nobody but me to do this for him. And so I'm always very grateful that I was able to do what I really, truly wanted to do. So when I come here and I, when I come here and I see all of you, I know, I know what it is, and I know how much you love your children. And there's not everyone in the world that is so determined as you people are to figure out what was wrong and what is happening and how you could fix fix this. So I love you all, and I feel like you're all part of my family. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Lots of magical creatures in this room. Thank you both for sharing uh, your experience. We hope to be able to support our families, to support the siblings and support the siblings through this process. Uh, we're all experiencing this in just a slightly different way, but we're here and we're here for each other. So thank you for sharing. Thank you, Lexi, for all the work you've done um, for the community so far, and we look forward to doing more. All right. Deep breath, breathe in. Keep it in, breathe out. All right, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and ask uh, Candace to come up. Yes, follow that, Candace. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> I'm Candace Huber, and Tim and I are the lucky parents of our nine-year-old Layton, who's an amazing big sister, and to Hutton, who y'all probably heard fretting a lot around this area this weekend. Um, we were, I'd say, num number 14. I'll, I'll say 14 now, um, about. So um, when we found out, I didn't know whether to just sit back and after finding the Facebook group, with, as everyone else kind of did, um, it was either sit back or jump in. And now that I know a lot of you, I, I know I didn't get to meet everyone, but once you get to know me, you realize that I don't have that in me to <laughs> just sit back. So we were all in. Um, and following Lexi and Miss Nancy, it, which is very hard to do in that right now, but um, if that doesn't give you inspiration to step up and raise money for our families, I don't know what will. 
Um, oh. So I am not a party planner. I am not a, a, a everyone, several families have asked, I'm not an um, event guru or anything like that. Um, we're very social and we like to throw parties and have a good time. Um, so that has helped quite a bit. But obviously our sweet, sweet Hutton has pushed us and you guys more than anything after we came to the first conference. It was very evident what we needed to do. Um, so we've done a lot of, we've uh, several events in Houston, Texas, um, very successful. We have an amazing support group. But we started very small and we've been growing and growing. Um, so with that, um, this year, so we've done two galas with about two to 300 people each. We've had a golf tournament. And then this year, because we do a lot of it ourselves. Um, I can't do the galas every year, it's a lot. Just like the family conferences, you can't do it every year. Um, so this year we're trying to do something a little different. I, I try to think out of the box and do get creative and do something different that people will actually want to come to. So we're trying to get everyone involved. Um, we did it the first year. I know all the families loved the first year <laughs> with us handing out raffle tickets and whatnot. But if you don't know how to get involved, if you want to start, this is baby steps. So in your packets, um, we are going to do a raffle this year. We, on November 12th, we're gonna have a Friendsgiving type party at our house and we're gonna invite a lot of our family and friends and um, big supporters that we've had for the past several years. And then we will get all the raffle tickets sold by everyone in across the globe and we'll, we will do the drawing there. So if we, we ask everyone to sell 40 tickets, it's not hard. They're $20 US dollars a piece. And if only 125 families sell these 40 tickets, we will make over $100,000, which as you know, all of this is very expensive to do, but that will be a huge, for everyone. Um, we would love for everyone to sell more. So for all the families that aren't here, we will gladly, Larry and Kayla will gladly ship tickets. But we know, so last night, several of the mothers brought up very good points. So anyways, you have the, raff, you have the, the booklets in your pocket. Um, they're just like old school elementary raffle tickets. Very simple, they're $20. They're good gifts. It's $1,500, $1,000, and a $500 gift card to Amazon. So they have three chances to win. And you'll sell the tickets. And then in the packet, you also have a couple things. So we made some little pamphlets just to kind of help you out so people don't, you know, it's a more legit thing. You can show them, whatever. And then we, I think we can, we can email these. Or you can actually just, it's very simple. Name, email, phone number and we will actually email the gift certificates to whoever wins internationally, so it's a lot easier. Last time I shipped these ginormous coolers to Australia and everywhere, it was a bit much, so we're sticking to electronic gift, gift certificates. Once you sell them, we just we will ask that you just fill, this, fill out an Excel sheet with everything, you'll email it to me, and then I'll cut everything into strips, put them in a big basket, and then the night of the party, we will do the raffle. Um, Several of the international families asked last night, so obviously this is in US dollars, so all you have to do is convert it, change it to what you need to change it to. You collect the money however you see fit. I started a Venmo for, my, for the first, very first raffle that we had, and it's JGA Houston. That's, it's been that, it has Hutton's picture. Everyone sends me the Venmo, and then I would send it over to JGA. Um, because California, like the whole raffle thing in California becomes gambling and it's kind of fuzzy, so that's why I'm able to do this in Houston and get everyone involved. Um, yes. <laughs> so anyways, listen, I know it's not fun to do this and it's not easy. Um, and Jess, I will use you as a prime example. So 
the very first one, first event, she calls and says, Candace, I can't do this. I, I can't sell raffle tickets. Like, I don't want to sell raffle tickets. This is, not, this is so out of my comfort zone. I said, Jess, get your girlfriends, go to dinner, order several bottles of wine, and then throw the raffle tickets on the table. And the next day, she was like, I sold all of them. Like, yes, it was so easy. So, you know, it, 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 it's the first one. Getting over the first one is hard. Or you just buy all of them and you get, the, you get lots of chances, but you're supporting a good cause. Um, but we will, I, I think we're going to go with PayPal, right? So, because PayPal is international, whatever the fees are, whatever, we'll deal with that later. It doesn't matter, um, which is very minimal. So you will collect the money as you see fit, and then we will send, we'll send the PayPal out to everyone. I know it's, we, we haven't made an account, so... We will make the account, we will send it out, and then you will send it to the one PayPal account, and then we will send, I will, I will send it over to JGA. Um, and then we will do some sort of live little drawing and all that. Um, if you have any questions, if you need more tickets, we, will, we have plenty. But again, like I said, if these ladies right here weren't inspiring enough, and this weekend wasn't inspiring enough, we can do this, y'all. I mean, we've been doing it for years. This team is amazing, these people. I mean, we love you guys. The research team, thank you. If Joe's wa I don't know if he's watching. We all love you. Thank you for everything you've done. So. Oh. All right. One more slide and then we wrap this up. Uh, we do have to pick up the children at 11.30, so we can't run too late, but we can always come back and if you have questions, do that over lunch while we're eating. All right, so how do you get involved? How do we get connected? So we created a simple summary slide, depending on where you're at and when you're comfortable with, you can do all or one or pick and choose. But we asked you to help spread awareness. We need to get the word out there. We need to connect to more families. Uh, we need to let medical professionals know about us. We ask you to tell your story. Uh, there are many ways you could do that on the blog, social media, on the um, podcast. Just tell your story to one person. Tell your story to one neighbor. And that's how we get the word out and we help our children as a result. You can uh, follow us on uh, social media and share your posts. And then uh, you can really advocate these big picture rare diseases um, items and help us move as a community uh, forward. Then you can support each other, support the families. And you could do that by uh, just being active on the Facebook group, welcome them when they come in and then answer questions as they get posed. And then become an ambassador and support your regional uh, families. And then um, we ha often have virtual get-togethers, in-person get-together. You're all here, so you understand the importance of that. But that's another way for you to be involved and supportive. We talked about fundraising. Um, the raffle is a great way to be involved uh, with that, and that's what we're asking from you uh, today. But you could also look at what else, what else you could do that. You could do that through Facebook fundraisers. You could do that through your company. A lot of companies do employee matching. You could do that through Amazon Smile or come up with an idea. We're here to help you make it happen. And lastly here is really supporting our mission. And the one thing you can do is support our mission by signing up, providing your data, moving us forward. That's more relevant to everyone watching us online right now. We really need you to do that uh, for us to move forward uh, with the data and the information. And then we have the special projects committee. Any thing we want to focus on, any pain point, we could use your help. We're growing at a, fa a fast pace that we never thought that's going to be the case. And with that comes more responsibility, more work, and we need you to do this with us. And then lastly, if you have any idea that you're like, we could do this, we could do that, many of you here know that I'll be like, let's do this, let's do that, right? No idea is a crazy idea. Whatever you want to do, we're here to support you. All right. Uh, this is my last slide. Do we have Joe on the line? All right, can we bring him up uh, here, please? 
Christina? Perfect. As you can see, Joe is now joining us. And we also, can we take one minute and just give Carol a big round of applause, please? love you. We mean it. <laughs> so let's take a minute and we're going to uh, take some questions. If you have a question for Joe, you can actually head to the back of the room. There's a microphone back there. You'll be able to ask your question. Joe will be able to see you and to hear you and he will answer here. So we'll be able to see him there as well. If you have a question for Carol, she will be up here and we have some microphones throughout the room that we'll be passing around. Joe, if you can hear me, I can. Is there anything that you would like to say to the group before we get started? Oh gosh, just listening and watching. What an amazing group. Um, I, I, I think I want to talk just for a second about inspiration. Uh, because inspiration is what causes all of us to do the things that we do in life. Our children, obviously, are amazing inspirations. Lexi, Nancy, Ozzy's parents and family, I want you all to know that all of those experiences not only are helping our research team, but they're helping, they're helping to inspire us to move forward uh, every day. I will always remember when we learned finally after 10 years what Jordan was facing we met with our neurologist and said, okay, well now we know what this is, what do we do? And, and his answer sounded quite simple and, and just as Cynthia and I listened, it was, well, we just have to find a way to get the research done to find a cure. As parents, that seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, I'm not sure any of us knew the journey it would take us on and and how, how many people around the world we would be involved with and, and putting together you know, a dream team of researchers. It was, it was really less than, less than one month, less than 30 days from that meeting that, that Cynthia and I were talking with Wendy Chung. And God bless Wendy, she within an hour said, okay, Columbia University is all in and we're going to put a dream team of researchers together around the world. We are going to find a cure for your children, and we're probably going to help a lot of other people in the world, too. And from that beginning, we now have, in New York City right now, an amazing group of families from around the world, and those of you who are online listening and watching in a virtual way, um, this story is nothing short of amazing. And Carol talked about the amazing progress in the research. We have three different ways. We're, we're working on three different answers for our children. We know one of them, if not all of them, are going to work, and it won't be long. Um, I, I think maybe Carol, Christina, it's important to let the families know how quickly this is happening, the fact that that we have a research team that all works together, how unique that is in the world. And to have 10 universities focused on our children and answers for all of our children is a pretty darn amazing thing. And we're all blessed to have that and to have people like Carol and Nancy and goodness, Jessica, and appreciate all the help. It does take resources to support our research team, to support the families around the world. We want you to know we're real serious about that. You can call, email anytime. The support is there. We have this amazing network of families that will help as well. And it won't be long before we'll be able to say we did it and have made an amazing improvement in our children's lives. So with that, if there's questions, research-related, otherwise foundation-related, we're here to answer. Any questions? 
<laughs> Again, if you have questions for Joe, you can head to the back. There is a microphone, so he'll be able to see you and hear you. Hey, Joe. Hello. <laughs> can, hey, you can hear me now. Um, so yesterday I raised a question after the researchers um, update, just in terms of where we were in terms of progress against sort of the milestones that everybody's looking at. You know, in, in San Francisco there was real positivity and real hope um, about this route towards the cure. Um, how do you feel that the research is getting on, you know, three years down the line? Has the progress that we were expecting to make been made? Um, have there been more complications come up that we weren't expecting? Um, and how do you feel just on the whole that, that the research is progressing? Well, as a dad, I want it tomorrow, right? I think we all want it tomorrow. One of the things I think we've learned here is that it does take time. The science is moving very quickly and we're benefiting from that. So uh, maybe I'll put it in this perspective. What I've been told, and I think Carol as well, as we have gone down this path, um, normally just the phase we've gotten to right now, which is we're ready to begin testing different possible treatments and cures, would be 10 to 12 years. Our research team and their amazing work in collaborating together, uh, we've done that in four years. So if, if that gives you a sense of sort of how, how much progress we've made, uh, we are going to begin, as Carol mentioned, uh, developing and testing ASOs this year. Uh, we are going to be furthering the effort in the genetic editing effort here, uh, both at UC Davis and with the rest of the team. And of course, the search for the right drug that could treat our children and make a, a big improvement in their lives is ongoing. We spent a good part of the day Friday, uh, early on, before things started there in New York with our research team. We're looking to answer a couple of questions. Um, and once we have that answer, which is basically establishing the right test, what are we testing for that will make the difference for our children, we can then quickly become, begin the high throughput drug screening. Uh, where we have the mouse models, we'll be creating more. But I guess, you know, it's a journey. Um, learning that, that we've made such fantastic progress in, in, with the research team working really about four and a half years together and in the three years since our meeting in San Francisco, it's, it's light speed in the science world, never fast enough for us parents and families and the children, but we're really, really close. I mean, the fact that we're going to begin testing and that we have really three different pathways, uh, we're blessed. There aren't, there are very few diseases, both rare and otherwise, that, that would have three different pathways to solve the problem for our children. So, you know, we hope uh, soon. I'm going to throw it out there, Carol, because I think it's the goal for us and for our research team that, you know, within a year, a year from now, we'll have some of those test results and begin to really look forward to the real push to help the children all around the world. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate that. Really appreciate the candid approach. And I also wanted to say, I just, Massive, massive thank you to the whole research team. I know I asked a couple of different difficult questions yesterday and this one today. <laughs> um, it's not to undermine anything that's going on. We appreciate it like, on behalf of all of the parents here. We appreciate it so, so much, everybody, for everything that you're putting into this. Um, thank you very much. Next question for Joe or for Carol, who's also up here taking questions. Did we answer everything? <laughs> Now's your opportunity. Sid's heading over. This one's for Carol. Um, 
Uh oh, what's the hobby gonna say? No, I'll, I'll just piggyback off of what Joe said regarding inspiration. And you know, I, I firsthand witnessed how tirelessly your project director works every day on behalf of us. It's not just this conference, but she is up into the wee hours of the morning thinking about how to move the research forward, what different activities JGA can do to move things forward. And not only is the team, the research team, so dedicated to getting the research done, I know just personally how, how tirelessly and dedicated Carol is. I lose hope sometimes. I'm a dad, you're all parents. We all lose hope. She never loses hope. <laughs> she's, she's always pushing. And, and you, you couldn't have asked, asked for a better captain of the ship. So you inspire us all. Carol, we're rooting for you. And she cracks a mean whip. Guys, I didn't pay him. <laughs> yeah, she didn't pay me for this. She no cracks a mean whip, trust me. I, I've got the bulk of the battle scars from it, and, and we'll get this done. Oh, geez. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> Gina, question in the back? Hello, I'm Gina from Romania, backslash Italy. <laughs> I just want to make two questions. How many cases do you estimate that are around the world not having the possibility to receive that genetic test to know that have this, this uh, Jordan syndrome like us? This is the first one, and the second one, how can we help them to get testing? In my country, if you want to get this uh, trio-west test that we made in Italy, it's around 6,500 euro. So it's not available. I receive uh, so many questions in my country because I made a little NGO for Sofia that have the same name, like Jordan Guardian Angels in Romania. And a lot of persons ask me money to make this, this test because they have some symptoms like Sophia, but I cannot help them because my angel is very little. So how could I do to help them if you have some idea and how could they, we help them to have an answer of this? Yeah, no, that's... Uh... You're right. You know, testing is a very important part, I think, when you know, Carol and, and some of the other families around the world, when we, when we first did the still experimental, and, uh, and you're right, quite expensive. Um, Carol, I'll answer this in a little bit, and then I think we'll get some more detail from, from you and others after, too. Uh, there is access through, through Simon's Foundation who is sponsoring the Spark for Autism program to get whole exome sequencing uh, paid for. Carol, what I don't know is whether that applies to children outside of the US, so maybe you right. can speak to yeah. that real quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that, that testing Joe is referring to is actually only available in the US. Um, access is definitely an issue even within the US, right? So. Um, it's, it's not an easy problem to solve, but I do believe technology is also advancing enough that uh, genetic testing that was thirty, forty thousand dollars five 40000 5 years ago is you know, $3,000 now. It's still a lot of money. It's still not available for everyone, but we're moving in the right uh, track. And then in terms of the numbers uh, of I undiagnosed, it's estimated that for 2R5D, it's uh, and really help me out if you uh, disagree with some of that. It's one in 50,000, roughly. Uh, so we potentially have 200,000 cases in the U.S. alone, undiagnosed, and then a lot more in the world. Uh, for 2R1A uh, and 2R5C, the community is smaller, so that suggests that the rate of occurrence is uh, less than that. So maybe one in 70,000 and one in 100,000. So they're all ultra rare diseases, but there's definitely more than 200 cases out there, maybe 300,000 cases out there that we need uh, to tap into. Yep. Next question. Karina, go ahead. Hi, Joe. So it's nice to see you. At least 
I created on the a... screen. <laughs> Sorry, I have been crying so much. <laughs> <laughs> I just was wondering, the other time in San Francisco, you mentioned that uh, the state of California did a great donation uh, to their research. And I was wondering if uh, we have such a thing for the following years, how are we managing with the finance? <laughs> I mean, to be sure that the research keep on for the following 10 years, let's say? So uh, there's a simple answer for that, Karina, but thank you. Um, we were blessed. We have received now two uh, substantial grants from the state of California. The first one, uh, as I remember correctly, Carol, was about uh, $12 million. The second one mm -hmm. was an additional $21 million. That we Uh, we have budgeted that uh, as a foundation through the University of California and all of our research team. Um, and we believe that, that those two grants, along with all the work that we all do as a foundation, will take us uh, all the way through human clinical trials with our children on the cure and keep the research going all the way through that period of time. So. We're, we're, we feel like the basic research is gonna continue until we have the answer. And our foundation is committed to making sure that we support that research team and effort uh, all along the way. But uh, right now, uh, we're, I think, in a good place uh, to be able to utilize that funding through human clinical trials. Right, I just wanna to add to that, that this is where that number came from, worked from the team backwards and said, how much do we need to get us to the finish line? And they came back with 18 million, Jill added a few, so we got 21 million. <laughs> and uh, so that's where the number came from. It's, it's based on what the team, at least for now, thinks we need to get uh, to the finish line. Who's next? Please take this as your opportunity to, to get all of those burning questions answered. We know you have them. I think Richard is headed to the mic. Yes. Right there for you. I just want to point out that this is a really oh. remarkable thing that Joe has been able to do to generate this kind of funding for the research. I mean, that's equivalent to many, many, many NIH grants that would take many years to get. And so I, I think that everyone, this is something he has done that is really wonderful for the children. And all the talks and seeing the children is super motivating to the team. And so I wanna thank Joe for that. Absolutely. Well, I, you know, Richard, thank you. I wasn't just me. It's, it's, it's an amazing team. And when you talk about inspiration, being able to go to the legislature in the state of California and show them all of you and all the children and families, it inspired them to do this. So it's truly, truly a team effort. Any other additional questions? Either for Joe or for Carol or for anyone else for that matter. <laughs> Any, questions online? Any questions from our online viewers as well? Nothing there? Okay. Any others? Okay. You wanna take a quick break? Joe, anything else that you would like to add for the group before we let you go too? I see oh, one oh, more one, question. One more, maybe. Karina, are you there? Yes. I am always here, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we love Just you, to break Karina. the ice, you know. Um, Joy, I know you are trying to do the best 
for everybody. And uh, as we are from very far away, my concern is always uh, to how are we going to do to take the med or any treatment outside? I mean, uh, this is something that I, I am very concerned of uh, because I know we have to wait until you get uh, one of the treatments approved, let's say, but uh, I always want to remind you to think on the, on the ones that are abroad because it's very hard for us even to get the medicine inside the country if this is a, a chance or to come here from outside is, is very expensive also. And you always help us. But are you thinking on, on those cases? I mean, how can we work on that? Yeah, so the answer, we've, we have uh, luckily our team um, and our board and Cynthia, my wife and I, we've been thinking about that issue from day one, really. Uh, that was one of the reasons why, as was mentioned earlier this morning, that it's the foundation that has the licensing rights for the use of the discoveries and cures that come out of our research. The reason for that, a very key reason, is to make sure that when it is time to partner with a drug company, with a biotech company, to actually produce that cure on a large scale, we will have the leverage, as Carol noted, to make sure that the cost of that treatment is affordable for all of our families. Uh, in all the different countries, by the way, we have a research team that is used to working with the FDA and governments around the world to, in fact, make sure that it's available. Uh, but we are 100% on board and knowing that part of our responsibility will be not just to find a cure for the children, but to make sure at the end of the day that every child has access to it. We're actually, we're 100% we're committed to that. At the other day, if a drug company won't cooperate with us on that, we will create a separate company here and produce the treatment ourselves. So we've, we've looked at all different options. We're ready to do all. Um, hi, Joe. This is Carol. I know you can't see me. Uh, I just wanted to send you all the love I've heard towards you this conference. Everyone wishes you were here. I uh, got extra hugs just to deliver next time I see you. Uh, we all love you, we miss you, we thank you for everything you've done uh, for our community, and we're really sad you're not here. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us this morning, and, and you know I've also seen the magic happen firsthand, so thank you for that, and uh, we hope to see you soon. So I just wanted to extend all the the love that I have felt towards you, to you, while you're on the line uh, from this room. So thank you for that. Well, Carol, I'll, I'll tell you, Cynthia and I right now are out in our backyard where it's going to be 105 today. <laughs> so we're enjoying the few minutes early in the morning. And you know, all we can say is you know, all that love goes right back at you. We expected to be there with you all this weekend. You know, COVID and fate stepped in, decided that wasn't going to happen, but uh, you, know, you all did a great job keeping things going. You know, thank you, Carol, Larry, Kayla, Candace, Nancy, everybody, Christina, Kay, uh, just making it all work. Uh, it was like we were there, and we feel that way, and, right. and, uh, and we'll follow up soon. All right. Joe, thank you. Yes, so much love. We missed you both. We're glad that you're safe, but we wish that you were here. So uh, any additional questions or are we all set? Oh, Michaela has one more. One for Carol. <laughs> hey, Carol. Um, I've got one question. I know you guys are probably exhausted after your four, five, three days here, but uh, when are we doing this again? <laughs> <laughs> right? We've had so much fun. As, as soon as Larry recovers from last night, <laughs> we're starting planning. <laughs> okay, cool. 